What we really meant was that there was scarce spectrum management because I would like to persuade you in the next five minutes that not only is there not a scarcity of spectrum there ever has been, and there never need be a, a scarcity. Now why does that matter? It matters because uh, Cisco, as an example, has stated that five years from now we will need somewhere between five and 40 times more bandwidth, more wireless bandwidth to accommodate all the wonderful things that are gonna happen uh, on wireless over that time. Now, <clears throat> now, where are we gonna find that bandwidth? It turns out there is not enough spectrum if we continue to use the spectrum in the same way uh, we did today. The only people that seem to think that there is a scarcity of spectrum uh, are the carriers. Well, uh, they keep uh, urging Congress to make more spectrum available. I have a feeling that they have uh, other motivations than just the, uh, uh, the spectrum. What they really want is exclusive use of hunks of the spectrum, uh, exclusive to the extent of excluding other people. Because if you look at how we're using the spectrum today, it's almost all empty. And you know that because if you look at the advertising of the carriers, they are urging us to do more things, more apps, uh, uh, more video. They keep telling us, use more and more of the spectrum. So clearly, there is a lot more uh, available. The, uh, the other way that you uh, know that there's uh, lots of uh, spectrum available is that the, uh, at the urging of the carriers, by the way, I hope I'm not offending any carriers that happen to be here today. <laughs> I've, I've spent my entire life battling with starting with AT&T 100 years ago uh, and with the uh, existing uh, carriers. I don't believe in monopoly. And as you'll see later, I'm not sure I even believe there ought to be carriers. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, the Obama administration, uh, administration has given the Department of Commerce uh, the uh, task of finding 500 megahertz of spectrum that the government is using it and making it available to the carriers. Well, think about it. Uh, they, uh, the carriers are using somewhere between, uh, somewhere around 400 megahertz of spectrum today, or not using it as the case may be. Uh, and uh, if, if Cisco is right, they're gonna need somewhere between five and 40 times more. If the government is ever successful in making some of this 500 megahertz uh, available, they're gonna take away from uh, public services and give it to uh, the uh, uh, carriers, uh, they will only perhaps add 15 or 20 percent to the existing spectrum. It's not going to solve any spectrum problems. The other, uh, so, so where does this, uh, how is this problem going to get solved? How are we going to end up with more spectrum in the future? Well, I did an analysis and I looked, started with uh, Marconi. When Marconi did his transatlantic transmission, uh, he used uh, as somebody pointed out, a spark gap transmitter, he used all of the available spectrum because he was the only one transmitting. <laughs> Not only that, he used it all over the entire world because he didn't care, there was nobody to interfere with. So I used that as the beginning and analyzed what the total capacity of the spectrum has been over time from Marconi's time to now. And guess what I discovered? that we have doubled the total world capacity of the spectrum every 30 months, every two and a half years, for the last 120 years. Now those of you that are quick at mathematics know that, that that's uh, two to a, roughly the 40 somethings, 20 trillion times more capacity. I would suggest to you that we now know enough because we're not doing very well at, at being efficient at using the spectrum uh, today. We now know enough that we can do that for another 50, 60 years. Another trillion times increase in capacity uh, of the spectrum. So I talked about, do we really need uh, carriers? Well, certainly you need somebody to build the uh, infrastructure. <clears throat> I'm sorry. What you don't need is exclusive use of the spectrum. Because if you want to use the spectrum efficiently, you just have to follow a few very simple rules. 
if somebody wants to do a transaction, a communications or some other event over the spectrum, uh, they ought to only use the spectrum at the time they need it. They ought to only use the bandwidth. They ought to only use the amount of power that they need to uh, accomplish that transmission. They only ought to cover the geography that they want to cover. And what did I leave out? Uh, pretty much covers it. If they do all of those things, then the capacity of the spectrum will increase by literally trillions of times. And we are starting to approach that. We have already, uh, obviously people only use the spectrum for the time, uh, they only use uh, uh, the bandwidth. Uh, the efficiency that they, of uh, spectrum use has been increasing, uh, increasing since the time of Marconi to the point where we're very close to Shannon's law. Uh, it's not a continuous line. The line has bumps in it as an example when uh, Irwin and Qualcomm introduced uh, CDMA, there was a bump in increase in spectral efficiency, but we've gone about as far as, as we can go in that regard. I thought I would uh, mention, uh, uh, as an example, one of the ways in which we are going to improve spectral efficiency in the future. Uh, think about, uh, the best way to describe our inefficiency is think of what a cell site does. A cell site's got a transmitter, in the middle, it transmits in all directions, uh, even with directional antennas, uh, as uh, John just pointed out, uh, you still have uh, energy going out in, in uh, big segments. Uh, and yet the actual energy that is used of all this energy that's dissipated in space is a tiny, tiny fraction. It's only the energy that impinges on the antenna of your cell phone. Now just think what would happen if you could in fact create a virtual wire from every cell site to the uh, cell phone. The, uh, depending on how thin that wire is, there's essentially no limit to how, in, how much you can uh, increase the efficiency. And these are not beams we're talking about. We're talking about optimizing the transmission from one point to another. So when we are really doing uh, uh, what they call, uh, uh, what, what's, what's the, uh, the uh, advanced form of MIMO, Paul? We're talking about massive MIMO. Yeah, massive MIMO. What you're doing is optimizing the, the transmission from a group of antennas and pro pro providing the optimum signal to reach a particular mobile. That ends up being a, a virtual wire. So I wanted to give one example of how we are going to improve the efficiency because I have to say something about GPS, which by the way, I noticed that uh, Vince, you didn't do so. Uh, uh, I, just, I don't want to be critical, but uh, <laughs> so, uh, think about the fact that uh, Almost all cell sites, you've seen them throughout the city, right? There are antennas everywhere you go are outdoors. Where do people talk? Almost all of our transmissions are indoors. Something's kind of unbalanced. Well, it turns out in the future we're gonna balance that problem. And in fact, we will have cell sites indoors. There's something wonderful that happens when you do that. If you can, in fact, provide GPS uh, indoors, and you, it is possible to use the GPS signals for a, a purpose that they were not intended for, and that is to create an RF model of the world. In, in an indoor situation, you're taking a, an, creating a model of the building itself, and this allows you to know how to share with other people. So uh, you now know, anytime you make a transmission, you now know in which directions, uh, at which, uh, uh, the amount of power, all of the criteria that I mentioned before can now be satisfied in an optimum way. And, and that kind of thing will result in 
huge increase in spectral efficiency. Now you say, how are you gonna do that? Well, there are people that are working on uh, deep indoor measurements of, uh, or use of uh, GPS. Uh, uh, one that I know of is, is called the IPOSI. Uh, and they are, in fact, today, uh, creating sensitivities for GPS of the order of uh, 100,000 times more sensitive than the typical GPS receiver. So all of that's gonna happen. Why does it have to happen? I think we are only at the beginning uh, of the uh, cell phone revolution. We're, the cell phone today is what I call the toy stage. Uh, everybody knows, remember uh, the game Pong? You know, where you had two paddles that moved up and down. Uh, and and uh, people would spend hours sitting there with a the, uh, joystick moving these paddles up and down. Uh, and then they became comfortable with the concept of uh, manipulating something on a screen, and they advanced to Pac-Man. And then got beyond that to the personal computer, uh, and that started a revolution of people using machines to enhance their uh, capability of, of uh, accomplishing things. I think we are still in the pong stage of the cell phone. Almost all the functions of the cell phone today that we use are convenient, but you'd hardly call them essential. We are about to move into a stage where there will be essential things that we will do with the cell phone in the areas of uh, healthcare. We are already starting to put uh, sensors on people uh, and uh, uh, there is the potential of sensing diseases before they happen in a person's body, having these diseases uh, recognized and treated before they actually become diseases. What's that require? Connected people and bandwidth. Our educational system is about to go through a, a massive uh, improvement based upon the fact that people learn all the time. You didn't start getting educated until you got out of school. Why not start at early ages, provide our children with access to devices wherever they are, and instead of having knowledge pumped into them, have them reach out for the knowledge, because that's what they do when they play games. The games suck them in. They're, they get interested in the games. The games challenge them. The games are uh, interactive and adaptive. Education is gonna move in that direction and that's gonna consume huge amounts of bandwidth. And the biggest thing that's gonna happen that's gonna consume all of this bandwidth that we're talking about is the concept of collaboration. Where our collaboration today is an extraordinarily inefficient process. What we do is what we're doing here today. We gather people together at great expense, because all of you have traveled here from one distance or another. Uh, and when the meeting, we do a great interchange of, of ideas uh, and information. And then when we leave, much of that kind of dissipates. There is the potential to have us connected together all the time in, in useful ways. And by the way, we're learning how to do that little by little. We've got Twitter, Facebook, a uh, hundred other applications that I don't understand, but those are going to evolve just as Pong did to the point where we will be interacting with other people in much more efficient ways. And what's the result of all that? Huge increases in productivity and we're gonna end up solving the biggest problem in the world today and that's poverty and that's a good time for me to stop. Thank you very much. <laughs>